And so today we're going to unpack a difficult verse in 1 Corinthians that speaks to this desire for relationships and intimacy. Now we have said in these 13 verses of of 1 Corinthians that Paul uses a template to warn us not to do what Israel did. And we have seen that from verses 6 to 7 that that these warnings are tied to desire and impatience and it was cravings and, and, and uh, idol worship. And we've seen how the foundational build, b- building blocks in us are being hijacked and used improperly. So we're going to read verses uh, 6 to 8 and land on verse 8 today. So we read out of this letter. Again, this is Paul warning. So he says, These things to, that happened to Israel as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did, so we would not desire, over-desire things we're not meant to desire, or worship idols as some of them did, that is, get impatient with God and create gods in our, own, in our own image. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulge in pagan revelry, and we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did. So, all of us are really removed from the historical Corinth uh, of the first century. We're removed and, and don't know the religious climate of Corinth. So it's helpful for us to know and note that in the first century, Corinthian communities, they included worship of idols mixed in worship with sexual expressions. This is something that happened. There was literally in Corinth temples of worship which included sex with prostitutes. This was a reality and a way to worship idols and express intimacy and and to fulfill relationships with gods. And this was an accepted and encouraged practice by the priests of those temples and accepted by the local population, and it was seen as a way to worship and to make things right and to bring certain kind of relationships to a conclusion or certain needs to a conclusion. And so for the early Christians who had been learning a new way of life in Jesus— This religious practice and this cultural reality of worship and sex in the temples was a real temptation. There was worlds colliding. And so Apostle Paul is warning the church in Corinth by reminding them that this is not the way of Jesus. And that this this current practice of worship and sex is the same situation, actually, that Israel found itself in the wilderness. Again, you may wonder about the relevance to us Certainly in today's world, we don't seem to be tempted in the same ways. We don't seem to go to, that I know, to temples to have sex with prostitutes in a way of worship. However, the connection with worship might actually be pointing to something more significant about our sexuality than we realize at first blush. I want to suggest that there's actually a deep intimacy and longing connected in us to our Creator. Therefore, our sexuality is connected to worship. There's lots going on here. And if we look at the broader context of 1 Corinthians, we see the discussion of sexuality is laced throughout the pages of the letter. The immorality of the ancient people of Israel and their story is also laced with sexual relations that are deeply connected and attached to worshiping false gods and idols. So what's happening here? I want us to note and to see that the reality that is being exposed in the wilderness is that we as people are deeply designed for relationship and intimacy. As we look for God, we get impatient with God, and we seek intimacy that that we feel He's not providing for us. And as babies from day one, hour one, minute one, we look for connection, we search deeply for a loving face to look back at us, and in the wilderness, in moments of isolation and desolation, we do not see someone looking back. See, the wilderness, as we pulled us away from God, made us impatient with God so much so that we began to constantly fix our need for intimacy in a variety of ways that just wasn't helpful. So what's being exposed in this wilderness journey and Paul is warning us about is the, is the longing for, t- uh, for intimacy that is being trying to be solved in a variety of ways away from God. But the story of God reveals to us that the longing is actually comes from God. That this longing for intimacy from day one is forged in us, is actually from God for God. And is shared with others only in a way that gives dignity and compassion that God gives. God desires that we actually connect with Him. He's a personal God. 
He desires to have a relationship with us. But in the wilderness, as we look for comfort, for love and connection, because of the disconnection and isolation, we feel the temptation to look towards sex to dispel the di disconnectedness. And there's a paradox in all of this. We're good at solving problems, even intimacy. But our solutions are more often than not outside of God, which creates more disconnection. And even though the solutions like sex feel like a connection, feel like intimacy, it isn't. So we keep chasing, chasing more connections, chasing them at our own expense, instead of trusting God in the isolation of the wilderness. So here's what it all reveals. It reveals how lonely and isolating we can feel at times, in times of scarcity, in times when things go wrong, in times when relationships break up, in times when families have uh, uh, fractures. The world is not as, it, as it, we thought it would be, and we could begin to, to numb that pain and try to solve it on our own, and we try to use sex in particular to solve the problem of isolation, even in marriage. And when sex doesn't become the cure of isolation, we hoped it would, we play the blame game and move on. And we search and move on, worshiping something that doesn't ever solve the problem. It all reveals our impatience with God. Apostle Paul reminds us that our worship then is actually deeply tied to our actions and sexuality. We are holistic beings who are, not, who are not to suppress who we are, but to trust our whole being to God. So the question for us, are we willing to trust God in the wilderness with our intimacy? Or will we solve it on our own? Intimacy in itself, sex in itself, isn't the problem. The problem is how we use it. And the wilderness is an invitation to strip, to strip all those learned responses to life, all those structures of Egypt, all those things of power, sex, and control, so that we might experience a reshaping, that we might experience a renewing of our capacity to love and to be loved. So what do we do with this? There's a lot of paradoxes here. There's a lot of feelings that be rising up. Finally, we're talking about sexual immorality or, or man, there's so much shame I feel where places I might have failed intimately. Or maybe there's just uncertainty, like, okay, what do I do with this? I have intimacy. God has made it into me and it's for him, but I still feel so lonely. What do I do with all of this? Can I give you a practical step? Pray. In their book, When Prayer Becomes Real, John Coe and Kyle Stobel make this observation, that prayer is not a place to be good, but a place to be honest. Henry now put it this way, the real work of prayer is to become silent and to listen to the voice that says good things about me, to gently push aside and silence the many voices that question my goodness and to trust that I will hear the voice of blessing, and that demands real effort. This is important. Prayer is important because in our honest conversations with God, we learn how God views us. And in his story, we learn his views us as very good. Mm -hmm.